We have won the battle against PowerPoint. Thank God for that. <laughs> Okay, everybody, I think we're about to start. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing volume, testing volume. Hello, hello. You're not very Testing, testing. Testing, One, testing. Two, three. Yep. Hello, hello. Yeah. Okay, if there is a last end like me, you yeah. just use this one to get everything. Okay, and then back up again. Yep. Yep. Otherwise, then I, I come and I Okay. Okay, great. We'll start. Just do that. And now, and now you can start. Hi everybody, uh, I'm uh, Dominic, this is David, uh, we're both from uh, Sydney, Australia. Something's not coming up on the screen. There we go. Anyway, and we work for a company called Massive Interactive uh, that basically writes user interface applications for pretty much every device. Connected TV, set-top boxes, tablets, mobiles, PCs, all that. In Sydney, London and New York. Uh, and we both work uh, on a set of um, products, uh, UI framework product written in hex um, that we license to a number of our customers. And they're all kind of like large scale telcos, TV broadcasters, device manufacturers, 
kind of people like that. Um, just in terms of where Hex is out there and some of the stuff we're doing, um, that's something that Cisco, their video escape platform, they're demonstrating at CES in Vegas at the beginning of this year, running on TVs and PlayStation and stuff like that, Hex. Um, there's a few other ones, uh, other TV apps running in both HTML5 and, and Flash-based platforms on set-top boxes and TVs, um, top one in the UK, bottom one in Australia. Anyway, that's kind of enough about, about us. Um, as a company though, you know, we love Hex. Um, we've kind of, over the last couple of years, moved all our different teams, we're doing JavaScript and Flash and various other technologies into a single team. Um, and all our um, UI kind of engineering projects are using Hex these days. Um, and you know, we actively promote Hex when we're selling to our customers, both as a services um, you know, for, for building applications, but also in our, our products as well. So quite often up there talking about the value of Hex. Um, and along the way, some of our product, excuse the feedback, some of our products we've rolled out into uh, open source things like Massive Unit and Massive Cover, the Robot Legs port, um, and a few others. Um, so yeah, as I said, we sell Hex into quite a lot of our customers around the world. And you know what, it hasn't always been easy um, because very often we're the first to, uh, first time they've heard of Hex is when we stand up in front of them. I guess everyone here today, we're all here because we've got a common goal, and that is we believe in Hex, we understand the value, and we want to see it get bigger and stronger. Um, there's kind of two ways we can get there. Uh, the first is grassroots, um, you know, by expanding out the developer base. And the other one is by getting more companies involved and behind it and supporting it and wanting to use it. On the grassroots side, the community is doing an ever-increasingly great job um, and I guess the two big, big ways, and kind of people touched on it already today, I guess, but targeted communication to specific subsets of developers who have their own kind of own value proposition in terms of what Hex offers them. And the second one is just the overall kind of image overhaul from the logo, the website, endless you know, threads about what the tagline is, all that sort of stuff. So you know, it's all very valuable on the grassroots level because knowing about Hex, developers knowing about Hex is you know, puts, plants a seed for businesses because someone goes, oh, you know, Hex might be able to solve this problem, we should look at it. So, um, but we're here today to talk about the commercial side of things. At a very high level, you know, adopting any new technology is a big risk for a company. Uh, it takes time to roll it out and evaluate it and move things across to it. Um, selling it into a company, there's different audiences you've got to consider not just developers and architects, but also the project managers and owners and also the key business de decision makers, you know, the CEO, the you know, directors who are ultimately making the financial commitment to use it as a business. Um, and in that, that final decision is rarely just technical. And if you get the wrong choice and you choose the wrong technology, it can cost you a lot of money. Um, obviously every business, every company working with Hex, every customer and business model they're selling it is different. Um, for us, I guess, it's probably slightly unique and we're trying to sell it as part of a technology solution and as part of our services, um, you know, and everyone's different. So I guess what we're talking about today is from our experience. Um, here comes Dave. We're not seeing any animations, that's no good. Oh. So the first difficulty with selling uh, technology choices to, to business is the variety of audiences um, who, you know, play a role in, in deciding on a technology to use. Um, the, the, the first and, and probably the one we're most familiar with is the technical expert within the uh, within the organisation. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this this guy here, uh, you know, James represents the the technical architect or developer within the organisation. Um, generally responsible for the overall technical direction and, and strategy for the business. Uh, you know, generally a seasoned developer, you know, you know, has a lot of programming languages under his belt um, and has heard it all before and as a result is very wary of, of magical solutions. Um, he's a relati relatively easy audience to get on side uh, because, you know, we can relate to, uh, to technical people quite easily. Um, all you have to do is put, put yourselves in their shoes and, and try to sell the strengths of, of Hex um, based on that. So an important thing is to identify their their credibility checklist. Um, so things like you know stability, performance, 
and documentation and support, uh, and try to compare features and strengths effects to technologies that they're familiar familiar with. So, you know, if they have a JavaScript background, then talk about you know, strong typing, auto completion, and, and the benefits of having a, a, a compiler. Um, if they're a native developer, then obviously a fast compiler is a big difference there, um, and also the ability to target the web from the same co code base. Uh, and if they're a Flash developer, then uh, there's really no convincing needed because the, si the ship is definitely sinking. Um, th the final point here is we've, we found in our experience that unless you have the time to, uh, to explain in detail uh, the more advanced features of, of Hex, like macros and um, you know, the compiler features, uh, it's really not beneficial to go into them unless you have enough time to, to sell the detail on how they work and how they can benefit the organization. Um, so the next, the next audience you need to consider is uh, the resident developer or programmer. <laughs> if you don't know what a programmer is, uh, there's, a, there's a very good uh, session on it's YouTube. It's a very, very useful video on the subject. Um, so Jimmy here represents the, uh, the developer within the business, so the person who's actually going to be uh, on the front line using a technology to, to, to implement solutions. Um, he's probably been there for a while. Uh, he's, he's responsible for and implemented much of the, the, the existing solutions and is probably now chained to, the, to their support. Uh, and if he's a programmer, he's also likely to quit within the next couple of weeks. Um, so the first thing to be aware of is it's, it's quite easy to a alienate developers um, up front with, with new technology choices. Um, you can quite easily overwhel overwhelm them with programming language concepts that they're that they're not familiar with, if you know, if they have a background in a very different technology, um, and if you aren't careful, the risk you risk making them feel, you know, making them feel like um, they're just a, a tool within the organisation, uh, which they'll re uh, react very negatively to. Um, so don't don't focus on the limitations of their current solution or platform. You know, avoid highlighting uh, all of the inefficiencies that Hex fixes for them. Instead, focus on, on the benefits that Hex is going to bring to them as a developer in their in their day to day work. Um, a perfect example of this is you know the benefits of compile time checking to to workflow, um, and type checking uh, APIs that they might already be familiar with. So you know JavaScript developers, um, it's you know not something that they're they're used to getting that compile time phase to their development workflow. But it can really it can catch a whole class of bugs that will make their lives a lot easier. Um, I'll say be careful when talking outside of their comp comfort zone. So, um, you know, there's obviously a huge spectr spectrum of experience in developers out there. Um, and you really need to judge your, your audience and figure out what they're comfortable with. So things like macros, generics, and type defs, um, you know, to a JavaScript developer seem like, uh, seem like magic and um, aren't really going to be very relevant to them. Uh, so try to base it on things that they're familiar with. Um, in our experience, developers feel threatened and then drive questions that are mostly irrelevant to the to the discussion. You know what, and they focus on what they do know in terms of you know CSS and JSON. Um, yeah, can it can it pass JSON? Yes. Or XML is the biggest question you get. It, and if you if you trivialize these issues, then it, you'll only make the situation worse. So finally, just. You know, focus on the day-to-day -day benefits. Uh, so, how it's going to improve their workflow um, and make make their life uh, easier in the long run. The next the next audience to consider and a, and a very important one is um, the project manager or you know those res responsible for process and delivery within the organisation. Um, so, Andrew here represents the, uh, the project manager of, of the group. Um, and it's in his nature to be a little bit nervous and risk adverse towards uh, unproven technologies. Um, he's he's ultimate, ultimately responsible for the, the delivery of software within the organization, so you know, the buck really stops with him. Um, so in the end, he's probably going to defer to the other stakeholders when it comes to the technical viability of, of HEX um, within the organization. Um, but it's still worth getting him on side to in, ensure a smoother transition uh, into the resulting project uh, once they've adopted Hex. Uh, so the focus when you're communicating to them should really be on delivery and predictability. So how can Hex um, help them 
you know, meet their deadlines and, and meet you know, the financial and, and functional requirements of, of their project. Um, Uh, so another thing is to focus on project specific challenges you know, that, that are, are relevant to the business. Um, so basically you want to demonstrate that HEX doesn't require developers to reinvent the wheel. So um, a great thing about HEX is that it plugs very, very readily into existing code bases through, through externs and, and functionality like that. Um, you, you basically don't want to imply that they're going to have to throw out their existing solution completely to adopt HEX. Um, so that's a really strong, strong selling point. Um, obviously, you know, focus on workflows, tooling, and conventions that are going to make their lives easier uh, when it comes to delivery. Um, and uh, also, sort of mention uh, integration with native APIs and libraries. The final stakeholder, and uh, possibly the most important, is uh, Ron, the big kahuna, sorry, uh, VP of strategic strategy. Um, so, the final decision will, will probably come down to them, although they're going to be informed by, um, by other people within the group. Um, you know, this guy is, is the CEO or a VP director of something important. Uh, he loves shiny things and wants more shiny things in the future. Um, so the focus here should be on the big picture benefits for, for the business. Um, in the end, what he cares about is the overall benefit of a technology to, to the business in the long term. You know, how, um, you know, ultimately, return on investment uh, and how it's going to benefit the business, uh, the business strategically. So, highlight the, the strategic benefits of HEX. You know, it, it's probably one of its bi uh, biggest strengths. Um, he's he's interested in how the technology aligns with the business the business's longer term strategy for growth and mar market direction. So demonstrate how HEX can give, you know, give businesses options and flexibility when it comes to, you know, moving between the platforms and not being, you know, not being too tied to the, the platform choices that they make. Um, you know, this is a unique feature of HEX that, um, that can provide business with, with options and flexibility. We've been in, in really interesting meetings with clients where, you know, they were throwing up, they were halfway through development on a JavaScript target for, for, for an application um, where Flash was also available, and they were, you know, throwing up the choice of whether they should switch to, to Flash because of, you know, certain benefits that the runtime offered them. Um, I think Hex is really unique in the in the fact that it gives, you know, gives people this, this sort of choice, uh, and it really doesn't hurt to sprinkle a few buzz buzzwords through your uh, presentation for this audience. Um. Okay, so we've tried to thought about how, you know how we've been doing this over the last couple of years, and we've kind of distilled it down to four different ways that, that technology is evaluated by customers. Um, the first is the perceptual. It affects all the different audience types. Basically, what's a brand and the message of solution? Does it, you know, does it feel right? Um, does it feel professional enough to use um, in a commercial sense? The second is strategic. Um, you know, how does it align with what we're ultimately you know, trying to do? Where can it take us? Um, the third is the practical. So, you know, how does it fit in with our current process? How does it impact, you know, if we change to this? Um, you know, how does it affect us being able to measure, you know, quality? And then finally, you know, does it actually solve our problem? Can this solution, can this technical platform, you know, do what it needs to do for us and do it better than others? Uh, so, the perceptual. I guess, you know, at the most important top level, a technology is like a brand. Uh, and, you know, first impressions really count. And for a lot of the audiences you're dealing with there, um, they don't, or they have probably a very basic technical understanding, um, which means that, you know, it's really evaluated on things like tone, consistency, design, um, rather than, you know, its technical merit against another, um, another technology. And these things really reflect certain things, like does this look like a one-man operation or is it like a, you know, a large, vibrant community, um, you know? Uh, investing in, in design and marketing actually reflects that you know maturity in a technology because you know the technology is there they're looking at how to communicate it which I think is something where you know that's at the point where, where hex is right now um, and you know I've kind of thought about that but you know often they don't have technical you know very little technical knowledge so you know, they know buzzwords um, and they kind of know HTML5 logo sometimes and that's about it um, 
Uh, I guess on, the, on this, you know, if the very first thing you have to do with, when you're introducing t technology is to say, this is how you pronounce it, and this is how to, to capitalize it, you kind of were doing it a bit wrong. Um, and I think, you know, developers kind of think, oh, you know, who cares? I've got more important things to do, like actually build and get this stuff out. Um, so, you know, but developers aren't the only audience. Um, another thing is really important is if you don't have slides in front of someone, spell out hex or hacks. Because we've had cases where people kind of got back in contact with them and said, Googled it, couldn't find anything, you know, typed it in, H E X, didn't find anything. And think about it, if someone can't find a technology on Google, like straight away, they're going to assume it's pretty obscure and, you know, and it doesn't exist. Um, you know. Uh, we all know that Capital X, you know, did make it faster. Capital H is going to make it faster still. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, non developers, you know, do things a bit gimmicky. Um, and it's good to see, you know, Nicholas uh, kind of same kind of conclusion, but proper languages have proper nouns. Um, and definitely when we're dealing with customers, you know, we're dealing with people, talking to people like, you know, Cisco and BBC and, you know, big companies, um, they know proper languages. And so putting it in there at that kind of level makes, you know, makes people assume it is, you know, it reflects on the quality and professionalism of the language. Um, so whatever you do, make sure you're consistent. Um, here's a little slide, kind of based on stuff that we've kind of done in the past. Um, and I guess the most important thing, I guess, here is, you know, a really concise statement at the top that doesn't, you know, I guess the most important thing is it isn't right once, run everywhere. And that's because everywhere is quite subjective. Um, businesses have heard it before with different t other technologies. And you don't want to make an audience skeptical up front. Um, you know, so focus on the real value and the true value to that audience. I guess on the side, on the on the main kind of points, these are points that are relevant to kind of the audience, of the customers and businesses we talk to. So it doesn't mention every single target that Hex supports. It doesn't mention every single feature of the language. It just focuses on high-level ones which are meaningful to that audience. Um, and while you don't want to get technical too quickly, it really helps to have a really simple example as soon as possible, because you see people and they're kind of trying to visualize it. Even the technolo technological people in the in you know in the audience. They're trying to visualize what you're talking about. And as soon as you show them a really simple example, they go, oh yeah, okay, it's not some crazy, you know, brain fuck or something. You know, it's, you know, it's a kind of language I can understand, I could understand. Okay, second one of these four kind of categories is strategic. Um, once again, more on the kind of technical strategic and, and business strategic. Um, so, you know, technology is important to companies that work with technology. So, um, and, the space is moving ever faster. There's more and more different devices and platforms, and it's constantly shifting. And businesses want to be able to adapt quickly to target their customers wherever they are and reach as many customers as possible. So, we really got to focus on, you know, how does Hex provide or you know aid that opportunity? Um, and I guess the ones that we always go, uh, we kind of always mention are things like being able to streamline effort, you know, have less parallel development streams for targeting different, you know, platforms. In the longer term, you also save money because you're only maintaining one thing rather than maintaining different things and trying to add features to you know, the multiple code bases. Um, you know, customers like this stuff because you know, less, less people doing stuff, getting more out of it is basically you know, more for less. Um, and again, you know, how does it provide an edge over, other, you know, over competition? Um, and often we always talk about, and use the example, Dave used the example before, about being able to switch kind of midstream potentially between technologies if the you know, environment or you know, the kind of the landscape changes and you need to adapt. Um, you know, I think what's really important with this is you know, never imply that it's a, it's a flick of a switch, it's a turnkey, turnkey kind of solution. You know, there's always something to be done to make it work on another platform, but it's a lot less. Um, so, uh, the strategic value of a hex. So for us, that's platform fragmentation is for our customers, that's, that's what they're scared about, spending too much, um, having to spend and maintain lots of things. So we really focus on how hex you know, helps this, because it, and we often come back to, it, it's designed to be cross-platform. It, it, it's the language without its own platform, and that means that you know, it, it works on other platforms much more effectively. Um, because we work in the IPTV connected television space, um, it's a young platform, it's constantly changing. Every year new models come out, whole new platforms, whole new SDKs. They switch from HTML to Flash or Air and back again. Uh, so, you know, our customers have been burnt by that um, a lot of in the past. So, you know, Hex provides a way of re reducing the risk of that 
So that's a big strength, a strategic strength for Hex. Um, then, you know, don't pretend that Hex is the only one out there. There are other solutions. And the best thing is to kind of, to acknowledge those and then, you know, really describe how Hex is, is well, ultimately better. Um, and once again, I think having cross-platform at a, a language level rather than a runtime level or kind of widget level um, is a lot more powerful, a lot more performant. It also means potentially you can pretty much um, piggyback off those competitors anyway by targeting them, um, which is, you know, companies like to hear this sort of stuff. Um, and I guess the final point on this is the kind of ongoing kind of roadmap and the strategy and how does that align with the business. You know, the HEX is going to be there for, for the long term. There are going to be more targets, you know. I think, Nicholas, what you're saying about, you know, the, every mainstream target we're there is a really clear message for that. Um, and that's what people, businesses won't only care about mainstream targets. So, um, yeah, good one. Here's another little slide, more mock slide, kind of based off stuff, you know, from our kind of presentation deck. But, um, you know, you can see you know, it's about, you know, return on investment, you know, reduced cost, um, you know, yeah, I've kind of gone all through it. But, um, you know, that's <coughs> benefits for business. Um, and there's not really that much technical other than a few buzzword icons. So the next priority um, that technology is evaluated on is the practical. So how is it going to fit in with the processes of a, of a company? Um, so this sort of uh, is relevant to our project manager audience, um, those responsible for delivery of software within the organization. Uh, for them, technology is probably the highest risk decision because, as I said, you know, they're on the front line and the buck stops with them. Um, they're, they're really they're interested in, in development and delivery of software and you know, of, of quality software and predict predictability. Um, the immediate impact for them is, is on efficiency and quality and you know, actually being able to deliver on time. Um, uh, it, it had a, an imp a huge impact on their day-to-day -day process, you know, how they're going to manage their team and how they're going to ensure the, uh, the efficient uh, delivery of, of software. Their burn down chart. Um, and long term, you know, it has a big impact on their, their ability, you know, the profitability of, the pro of their projects and their ability to innovate as well. Um, so, really focus on delivery processes. Uh, you know, developing software, as we all know, is a very complex process. Um, a practical assessment will focus on, on what tools HEX provides uh, to accomplish this. So, things like code qualities, you know, measurable and automatable QA, test-driven development, CI, all of those, those sort of things. Um, collaboration, you know, what frameworks and processes exist to allow large teams to work on, on a project together. Um, <coughs> predictability and resourcing is another big one for us. You know, the HEX community is, is growing, but it's still, you know, it's not something you can advertise in your standard job bulletin for. You know, there's no, no uh, keywords out there for HEX quite yet. Um, so that's, that's another key consideration. Uh, and lastly, you know, technology is a platform. It's, it's not just about the language and the compiler in isolation. It's, you know, how, how, do the, how does the ecosystem support um, processes uh, built on top of that platform? So, you know, the maturity of that ecosystem and, you know, things like, you know, are there established best practices for building uh, applications in that technology? Um, a, as an aside, you know, this is, this is something uh, we started using Hex about uh, two years ago and um, at the time that there was definitely uh, more of a lack in, in this area than there is now. Um, you know, w as Dom said, we, we deal with some pretty big names and they have really high expectations around, you know, not just delivering their software but also ensuring, you know, assuring them that it's, it's you know, tested and stable. Um, so, you know, fortunately, Hex provides some really uh, useful tools for building these kind of solutions. So, um, you know, things we have up here, uh, you know, MUnit, MCover, and, and one of our internal build tools. Um, and we've invested a, lo a lot of time and, uh, and effort into building, you know, really streamlined workflow for, for these sort of problems. So finally, you know, the, funnily enough, the last in our list is, you know, the technical suitability of, of Hex to, uh, to a given problem. Um, 
developers are problem solvers and they're going to evaluate technology uh, based on how efficiently and expressively uh, it allows them to solve their, their problems. Um, ironically, they can be you know, a, a tough audience to convince. Uh, you know, we're all fiercely loyal to the technologies that we know. You know the, the Flash HTML fanboy battles have been raging for years. Um, you know, we're all skeptical of magical solutions, and Hex, you know, let's admit it, looks pretty magical on the surface um, as, as a solution. Uh, and we all defend to the death the choices that we've made in the past and, and the code that we've written. Um, that sort of not invented here syndrome. Um, they're going to ask all of the hard questions of you. You know, what is support like in terms of documentation, community, and libraries? You know, what is the, the tooling like? This is, this is something that's drastically improved in the last couple of weeks with, with Hex. You know, we now have uh, three, three mainstream development environments that support Hex quite well. Um, and, you know, a key one here is the expressiveness of the language. I think one of the biggest strengths of Hex is, you know, it supports a wide variety of programming styles, you know, functional programming and uh, object-oriented programming and things like macros just allow you to, to solve a very wide problem set um, in a very efficient way. Um, and finally, as I said before, just you know, use familiar comparisons I if possible. So you know, identify your audience, what, what they're familiar with and what their existing solutions are built upon, uh, and use that as a basis for identifying you know, what pain points they might have uh, and what, what, what Hex can do for them. Um, oh, finally, yeah, Hex is not perfect. Uh, no one's claiming it is, but it's, it's really important to identify any weaknesses um, that Hex has so that you can set the tone for discussion. You know, there are some, um, shoot, next slide. There are some sort of perceived weaknesses, you know, like um, performance, documentation, and support, which are, are really not a problem for Hex. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's a, a slight overhead to, to cross-platform solutions, but I think uh, Hex, by the very fact that it compiles to native, to native code, um, addresses some of those. Um, documentation, there is a lot of documentation out there, it's just poorly organized at the moment and I think that's something we, we need to work on as a community. Um, and support, you know, I think we have a great community and uh, the mailing list is a, is a pretty friendly place to be. Um, so, you know, there are actual weaknesses. Um, so tooling, as I said, that's improved, <laughs> that's improved since we wrote this uh, presentation actually. Uh, but There's still a way to go. I mean, I think a lot of our customers, you know, the first thing they say is there an, is there an Eclipse IDE for it? <laughs> which there <laughs> is, but which there is, but it's yeah. not very good at the moment. Yeah, and I guess, it, but you know, the perception that a, a you know a language needs an IDE, or at least and a single IDE for it to you know to be a real language. Yeah. Uh, things like developer base, as I said before, our counter argument to that is that it's you know very the hex is very familiar to Flash developers and JavaScript developers. You know, it's, it's very easy to retrain people. Um, in Hex, and that's that's what we've had to do. Um, and you know, there's there's always some concerns about a non-native experience. So if you're trying to sell Hex as a, you know a native solution for mobile, or, um, you lose some of some of that native experience of building with uh, you know Cocoa Touch or with the Android mm. SDK. Which I guess isn't such an issue for games, but when you're working on other kind of apps on on these platforms, that nativeness of the kind of UI can be quite a big issue. And it's actually not such a problem for us because we built you know, IPTV interfaces, which are generally uh, not very defined at the moment, um, which is fortunate. Um, so in the end, focus on, on the real strength of the language and the, and the compiler. So as I said before, functional and OOP styles. Macros are just you know the standard response you get out of Nicholas these days is I think you can do that with macros <laughs> when you want him to add something to the compilers. Uh, you know, they're an amazing tool and they really open up a lot of possibilities for us. So, you know, Massive Cover, which is the code coverage uh, framework we wrote, that's all built on, on macros. Um, and it's very easy uh, to add that sort of, uh, you know, very different functionality uh, with that ability to manipulate the, the AST. Um, and Nico, I think, is, is hugely un underrated. The fact that the language comes packaged with a really lightweight um, cross-platform VM just opens up a, a huge range of possibilities in terms of automating workflow and simplifi simplifying developers' lives. Um, finally, yeah, 
embrace and extend their platform. So, you know, externs and hexlib and native extensions mean that, you know, you're not throwing away your existing platform, you're, you're just, uh, you're extending it and using, using hex as a, as a tool on top of that. We have a little example there, but I think we'll, yeah. These slides will be up, there's a link at the end. So just looking at how to really kind of convey the expressiveness to other developers. I think we'll just jump through that right now. Um, so we thought we'd compile a few of the few of our favorites. Um, yeah, HTML, you know, why do we need anything else? Because HTML5 is everywhere. Um, you know, I think here, the important thing is to go, yeah, so HTML5 can do everything. Hex can do everything HTML5 can do. Um, but you can do it better. Uh, and when HTML5 can't do everything, uh, Hex pr can provide you an alternative that can. Um, yeah. So we won't, this require more effort. So Hex can help you reach uh, more platforms for less effort, for less development effort. Uh, it can save you money by you know, implementing those features and, and you know, and enhancements once. Um, and the workflow, because of things like Nico and macros and the control developers can have, you can actually really customize and streamline your developer workflow as well. Um, so maybe not HTML5 is all things, but we only care about HTML5 and iPhone. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, still two separate development streams if they're gonna go down that route. And what about all the customers they can't get to from to making that decision of those two platforms? Uh, you know, and, you know, Hex, kind of helps you kind of sit, and to some degree, sit above whatever's happening down below. Um, won't perform as well. But I think we always say, granted, there is a slight overhead, but, you know, can the end users notice? Um, and in most, you know, they can't. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, really drives it back to why do you care about performance overheads or what looks like, you know, performance overhead. Um, and we always use the example of, you know, like lots of the people here in the room, uh, that you know, hex is used to write games where performance is critical. So if there was too much overhead from that, it just wouldn't be possible. Um, and this is our favourite. <laughs> 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 um, now, this happens. It happens less now, but it used to happen to us quite a bit. It was usually because there was a you know, resident developer sitting in there. They, uh, you know, they didn't understand all the concepts, language concepts we we're talking about, and. So what they do, they said, you know, oh, that code, that JavaScript code looks, looks horrible. You know, it's nowhere near as good as, as this handwritten code. And the really important thing to do is make sure you're comparing source with source. Because any of the other technical stakeholders you're dealing with, they will look at the source, they will see that benefit, um, you know, and that difference and the maturity of it. Um, yeah, make sure you're comparing apples and apples uh, with that. Um, and also, you know, the other example thing we always talk about is optimal code and generate code isn't always pretty. We use an example of a for loop Every language has an efficient way of doing a for loop. It's not always the one that you kind of feel right naturally. Um, but you know, with Hex, you're able to, you know, what's generated can potentially be a more efficient way of doing it. And inlining as well. And inlining, and yeah, there's so many examples of it. Um, so we just sort of end on, on a bunch of thought points that both of us and, and, and our teams in, in Sydney and London as well have kind of been thinking about, and how as developers can we kind of try and improve things. Um, won't read through all, all these, but I guess, I guess with all the libraries out there, there's so much out there, but how do we make more use of that? Um, you know, how do we show what's being used, what's popular, what's recent? You know, what is the real coverage cross-platform of those different libraries? Um, you know, I think the other thing is, we've got so many talented people in this room and, and out in the community, and everyone, there's a lot of people doing very similar things, or not finding you know, what's out there, and, and, and you know, duplicating ideas. Um, and how do we, how can we work to kind of make more collaborative libraries rather than individual libraries and more targeted libraries rather than kind of general purpose kind of, you know, every utility and feature in, in you know, in the one library. Uh, I think a really important thing is to look at how, how we can kind of define some best practice, you know, coding standards. Um, obviously we've got different people coming from very different backgrounds and you know, have very different kind of functional and object oriented backgrounds, you know, ways of doing things. So maybe it isn't a single standard, but maybe a set of standards. Um, I think it gets around documentation, and I think David touched on it before, how do we find this information correctly? How do we know, you know which version it's applicable to? Um, you know, potentially like how you know, the language specification, be able to point to that and, and people be able to see that. 
Um, and I think as we look more and more into the cross-platform and handling multiple platforms, and something we deal with a lot, you know, how, how can we kind of make a more consistent process for, for working with those and targeting those and doing all the other things around it? I mean, I think NME's doing a, you know, there's a lot there to try and help kind of do that kind of more complex build process. Um, but that's something that's applicable to, to everything, you know, all targets, I think. Um, so, just some of our thoughts. Uh, any questions? <laughs> big thing you may have left out is uh, credibility. Um, if, especially if you're going to uh, sell Hex to, to your boss. Yep. Um, one thing they will probably ask is uh, how, how can we rely on the fact that this language, this exotic thing that you're presenting here will still be there in two years, four years. Um, if you are going to retrain your developer, uh, you, can, um, you, you can make a lot of strong points why you would do it. Um, and it can offer the company a lot of money. Mm. Uh, but if it's not ever done by, uh, by competitors, for instance, um, the, the switch might be hard. And do you know of, of a lot of other companies like Massive Interactive where the teams have been consolidated, all the different teams are consolidated into one and everyone is doing Hexi now? Yeah, we, we, know, we know a few where there's teams within them doing things and changing over to Hex um, for specific parts. Um, and I guess our unique thing is we are dealing with lots of different platforms um, all the time. Um, so it was very much a, there was a kind of financial resourcing benefit from doing it. Um, I think but we touched on it before about the kind of, you know, the will it be there tomorrow kind of thing, which is a, you know, a question we do get a lot. I think, you know, Hex has been around for a long time and I think you can demonstrate a lot if you do kind of talk through some of that roadmap and that iteration and the quality there. And when you talk about, you know, the targets that are coming and, and you know, and that vision, it's a fairly relevant one. I think people are getting more. Oh. You know, uh, I actually have a, a good answer to that. Is that uh, is any technology you're using, w will it be that? Yeah. yeah. Would, uh, what would people say about Flash? Flash? Like, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah 12 months uh, ago. Yeah. Flex is a great example and, of that. And actually, uh, this is more a strength for Flex than uh, uh, the opposite, because uh, you can use your code, you can still have your code even if the, if the platform, uh, Adobe doesn't think that <laughs> Flash is profitable, <laughs> yeah. you still have it. And, and uh, in fact, and you can also output that, you've got that <laughs> output code, so at some point, you, you know, there's an exit strategy. It's probably not the ideal one, but, you know, if that was to happen, you can output to, to ActionScript or to your JavaScript and kind of, you know, and move on. Yeah, yeah, it comes up, but I think, you know, and it's like, yeah. Um, my question was, uh, are you going to put those um, cheat sheets to code files? I'll put them up, yeah. We've so got maybe them. Maybe you can get them on the hack site so that we can download them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sometimes they come to what is the hack site? Something like that. You can just put the cheat sheets. So if you go here, this URL, we've got this up there, but we've also got a couple. We've done a few to JavaScript um, user groups and, and, and Adobe, so Flash user groups back in Sydney. And we've got slide decks for that as well. So we've kind of targeted to developers. So yeah, absolutely. And I'll try to put up some of those little cheat sheet ones that we had in here as well. Um, I'll put them up on the same site. It, it's happened, but I think, you know, I think what we, we actually went through a kind of a last slide where we kind of started by saying, you know, talking about hex quite, quite quickly up front, but not very well, I think. And then we started trying to not talk about it. So we're kind of, you know, then people go, but how, how, do you, how are you doing what you're doing? And I think we've gone, come back full circle. We're a lot more confident in how we're doing it. Sometimes customer, customers do. Um, we've had customers that we have gone, no, we don't want to do that. And now they've come back and they've gone, 
you know, that platform's changed, we now have to do it like this way, now we have to do it in a third technology, we're going to do it with you. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes businesses aren't ready to, you know, to make that decision, but, um, you know, we kind of... Yeah. And, and we have the benefit of having, you know, all of our Hex developers have either JavaScript or Flash backgrounds, so, you know, if they absolutely refuse, we can always build something bespoke for them in those yeah. technologies, although it's not our preferred approach. Yeah. And we don't actually end up doing that very often anymore. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, but before there was the NME kind of option, people were very hesitant. Um, I think some of our customers were quite hesitant about that whole being on these things. Um, but focus on how it makes him look better. So if the team's more efficient and there's less people and there's more ability to move people around and resource people around that. Well, um, that that's But then, I guess, more of a flash action script developers, a lot of them are kind of looking at opportunities to broaden out from that now. So, the, uh, you know, tapping into that. Yeah, I mean, there's some people, we've had people, we had, we had a JavaScript developer, and, the, you know, he said, when this kind of having said, why would I learn Swahili? Um, <laughs> to, you know, to, to speak, to translate into English, you know, and, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a valid sentiment, sentiment that's out there. Um, he actually, you know, you know, working with him, he actually became very, probably the quickest to adopt it and to really see the, the value of it. Um, so, yeah, I think stick with yeah. I think it, it you know, but it's not it's not unique. It, it feels like it's unique to Hex because we're dealing with these different platforms, and it, you know, Hex doesn't have its own platform. But it, it's kind of very similar with a lot of other kind of technologies. Um, trying to make sure that Hex looks like it is a you know a stable you know professional kind of you know option out there. I think is is the key bit to people not kind of feeling hesitant upfront. So I think the perceptual of all the kind of things. Perceptual is still really key, and sometimes if someone's already had some exposure. It's um, it's a bit hard to reset that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think you you also need to be quite strategic in situations like that about identifying you know some small problem which Hex would solve for them, uh, which you can demonstrate. You know, in the end, the proof is in the pudding. You know, if you can show some small way, you know, some pain point in your process or your project that Hex would address very elegantly, you know, proto prototype it up and just say, look, you know. If we were using Hex, then you know this wouldn't be a problem for us. 